Hey everybody, it is February 5th, 2017, and this is your episode 80 of At Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as always are Laurel Black. Hi. Megan Arns. Hello. Ben Charles, how's it going, buddy? I'm doing well, hanging in there. <laughs> good, good. And we have from the sub list, who just did a concert last night, Tracy Wiggins. What's up? Uh, it's going well. How was your concert, buddy? It was a lot of fun. I mean, it was a whole uh, John Williams concert. So it was basically about every John Williams movie score you could come up with. Um, and it was a lot of fun, too, because it's with the Huntsville Symphony, and it's a phenomenal percussion section to play with. Um, so you're just going in to play with those guys, Sean Rittenauer and Scott Crawford and Terry Cornette and stuff. I mean, it's just you learn a lot just standing next to those guys playing every night, too. So. Was there some Catch Me If You Can music in there? That was actually the one thing that we were surprised wasn't on the program. Sure. Uh, we played we played a piece from The Terminal, which I didn't know that score at all. Mm. That's actually a clarinet solo. Um, the conductor played the solo on it. But it had it had the, the obligatory Star Wars, Jaws, complete with shark fin going up and down behind the horns as they played. And, um, they had the... 501st Legion come in, so they had all the costumes and stuff during it. So it was fun. Kids had a lot of fun watching it. There's a, sure. um, yeah, well, there's great. a student have here that here just today. won our concerto competition with Escapades, so I think I'm going to get stuck with that vibe part sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Hey, well, also from the sub list here today is Caleb Pickering right next to me. Hey. And listen, our guest today, you guys, he's a composer and percussionist. He's a lecturer of music at Troy University and has performed with many symphony orchestras in the Texas, Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida. Let's see, his compositions and arrangements have been performed by groups including the Kaisha Trio and even Nexus, which is amazing. Let's see, his works are published by Drop6 Media, Hanmar Press, and Innovative Percussion. He's a performing artist for Evans Drumheads, Innovative Percussion, and Pearl Adams and also Sabian Symbols. I met him back at the Birch Creek Festival one summer a few years ago. So welcome, Brian Nosny. How's it going, buddy? Hi, great, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure, you're very welcome. Hey, how was the Protest the Hero concert? It was awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> it's always great. I think I said it on Facebook. It's always great when you can see a band live and they sound just as good, if not better, than on the albums. So. And it's I've not had that experience, couple. definitely, and I've, I've had that experience where it's the extreme opposite, where the things they do on the albums are so amazing, and you think, okay, there's no way they can do this live, and when they don't, it's a bummer, but when they do, it's, yeah, something. Yeah. They How were... long have you been a fan of that group? You know, Lewis got me turned on to them a couple years ago, so I've only okay. about, no, but they literally for they've been like my obsession for two years. And Lewis Rivera, uh, Megan and I's friend down at South Alabama, he um he had mentioned that that was his bucket list. That was his one of his favorite band, his one favorite band that he has not seen live yet. So I've been trolling them forever to wait and see when they would be here, and they were in New Orleans, which is close enough to I was like, all right, man, let's let's get down there. So that's awesome. That, was good. that answers my that answers my follow up question, which was, <laughs> did that solidify your friendship with Luis Rivera? <laughs> my friendship with Luis Rivera has been solidified for quite some time, <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately. <laughs> I had a friend growing up in Utah who would go see these obscure metal bands with me. His name is Robbie Linton, and we had this great friendship because he was the only person who knew a lot of these groups and right. would thus go with me nice. well that means we can't ever have lewis on the podcast because that's all you guys have talked about then <laughs> you know what what's funny is actually his wife is even more of a metal head and knows even more obscure bands so we were driving there and she's mentioning yeah hey, we're going to see this band and this band and this band and i'm like i have no idea what you're talking about at this yeah point. they're perfect for each other yeah they are it's pretty cute <laughs> Wow, well, that's a good I one. had a, a quick little anecdote I wanted to share before we got started here, actually, about Brian, because I was a freshman at North Texas, I think Brian's last year there, um, and growing up, I had been a pianist, and um, I like every composer I knew was dead, <laughs> and so Brian was actually the first 
living composer that I ever like saw, met anything. <laughs> and I just thought that was so weird that someone was alive composing music. Uh, <laughs> And he had, uh, I think it was a marimba quartet called Purdy's Maze. And there was yep. a group of some of like the, the upperclassmen. I know Mike Hodges and uh, Kara, I can't remember her last name, and a couple Kara, others. John Johnson, I think. Yeah. 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 And I remember like hearing this piece and just thinking, like, oh my God, this is really cool. Like someone alive has written a piece of music. <laughs> so, anyway, that was my little my introduction to Brian Nosny. I thought that was kind of cool that he was, like I said, the first. <laughs> living composer i ever met and he's still alive which is good because we have to do a podcast today <laughs> that that is that is true i'm i'm, I'm, I'm you trying to add that to your cv that's... brian <laughs> what's, what's that megs you can add that to your bio <laughs> I, I should. still living brian nosny is <laughs> quote from ben charles <laughs> holy shit a living composer <laughs> this podcast would be a lot more awkward if we were doing weekend with brian here i think uh, i think <laughs> the uh I think the, the quote that goes in your bio needs to be, Brian Nosny is one of the living composers that I've met. <laughs> Dude, that's ben that's going to go on my website like right after this. <laughs> Dr. Ben Charles, DMA. <laughs> hey, well, speaking of Dr. Ben Charles, you guys, you guys were at UNT together. And am I right that you didn't know you were at UNT together? Yeah, I'm, I'm a jerk. I, yeah, I... I, I Facebook messaged him and said, "Hey, just wondering what the history topics can be. Uh, you know, I'm sorry we haven't met yet." He's like, "Uh, we were actually at NT together." I was like, <laughs> it was like there, your were, second like, year. there were like 30 or 40 people in my freshman class, though. There's no reason that Brian would have known who I was. He was yeah, busy posing, not making friends. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I don't know. About I was just busy trying to get out of there. <laughs> and living. So, so, but yeah, so I didn't know him, and I, I was a jerk for that. But I'll make it up to you somehow. So that was a master's degree for both y'all, right? No, that was my undergrad. That was undergrad. My master's. Brian's master's. Got it. And Brian, you're a Virginia Tech grad, right? I am. Ah, okay, cool. Anyway, that's that's my neck of the woods now. So I have to know about that kind of stuff. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, speaking of you as a composer, we do have one little question from... Another friend of ours, Ben Fraley, and a friend of yours, because he's there at Troy University, right? Is. Yes, he is. And I he taught Ben Fraley how to play cymbals. Oh, but good. <laughs> you, oh, at Hart. That's, I didn't know you guys were at Hart together. I was doing my doctorate when Frails came in as a freshman up there. Man, so you, was, Gene, was Gene Kaczynski there as well at that point? Yeah, Gene and Tim came in right after I left. Okay. But yeah, picture a freshman Ben Fraley. and Yeah. <laughs> I have so many things I could say that I won't right now because Ben will kill me. He will drive over. He only lives like less than a mile away from my house, so he will drive over here and kill me as soon as he finds out that I've said. So I'm gonna just be quiet now, safer that way. I bet he doesn't listen. It's very hard to tell if anybody's actually listening to this <laughs> podcast. It's very obscure. Hey, did you guys know? Have we said this on the podcast before that the way Tracy and I know each other is that we met in Jordan? No. no, come on. Really? <laughs> yeah. Nope. Yeah. Huh. Which when, long story. when you're saying when you're talking about heart, yeah, the long story short basically is that uh I I I'm assuming that Tracy knew um well actually Tracy, do you want to tell the story? Well, I taught Tim Brocious when he was yeah. an undergrad at Sanford. Okay. And then he went over to Amon to teach uh to teach over there. And then after he left, Megan went over there to teach. At and that was also my connection because I think he knew right. John Parks right. from Sanford. And that was also my connection to Tim. And then, uh, one of the orchestras that I was playing with when I was in North Carolina, the conductor's father was the head of the National Conservatory. So they took a bunch of the members from the orchestra over to play with the symphony and everything. And Megan was the percussion teacher when we went over there. So, Come yeah, on. It was That's crazy. That's yeah, it was so cool. Yeah, and Tracy was like my guest artist. It was amazing. It was, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't bring anyone over here. And I was like, a percussionist from the United States is coming. Oh my gosh, we're having a guest artist. <laughs> it was amazing. I was really excited. I was really sick when you came. I remember that. I barely had any voice. Yeah, you were very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that that's not the case in real life. So. <laughs> well, it just well, goes just amazing. Show. I don't know. I guess we're sick of hearing it, but it's a small world. And yeah, it's, it's like a. Uh, we were telling you we have a guy in our steel band here uh, named Greg, and it turns out when he was in high school, he's probably in his early 30s, but when he was in high school, um, his drumline tags were a Bajinder 
and Andy right. Akiho. <laughs> yeah, so so Greg is a math professor here, and he's oh in the steel gosh. band. He's a great pan player, but mm-hmm. yeah, Ball yeah. Jinder and Andy Akiho were his oh, teachers. That's awesome. Yeah, ridiculous. Hey, uh, back to Ben Fraley's question real quick, just so we get Brian talking about something music specific. We what don't have are to. the do's and don'ts of arranging? What are they? Oh, excuse me. If there are do's and don'ts of arranging, what would they be? I mean, thanks for, you know, try and softball them in, Fraley. Jeez. <laughs> um, you know, really, to me, it just comes down. It, this question stems from I have a, a, an arranging clinic that I do in a, a lot of different places. And it's just kind of a I call it a real world perspective. Basically, all the things that they don't teach you in your arranging class and in college, not not to knock on them, but they have so many other things that they have to go over that I realized when I got into the real world and started like getting paid to arrange, I was running into all these things that I'm like, I, I don't know how to handle this situation. Did I, did I miss this day in class? Like what's going on here? And, um, so do's and don'ts. I mean, I guess the big, the biggest ones are realize that not all tunes need to be arranged. Like there's mm-hmm. plenty of songs out there that I love and that, I, that aren't for say percussion that I'd love to be able to do something with. But the reality is that when I try and do them, I realize that it's just never going to work for whatever reason. You know, you know, uh, it, because the textures can't be matched enough or the, or the texture is what makes that song. And so if you lose that texture, you basically, it's just pointless to try and do. There's all sorts of things like that. So, um, <laughs> Enter Sandman would be one of them, yes, in the chat, um, that probably should not be arranged for percussion. Well, Laurel has a specific story about how it should not have been arranged. Oh, my okay. God. Yeah, okay. All right. So, um, Do it. Um, Do yeah. it. <laughs> Abridged version. This is undergrad marching band working on stand tunes during mm-hmm. band camp. And our director, who shall remain nameless, um, decided to ar- <laughs> God, it's so bad. arrange it for marching band. And everybody knows Inner Sandman starts on an upbeat, mm-hmm. like a syncopated and a kick yep. into the riff. So anyway, he arranged it, but didn't start it on the end. Started it on beat one. <laughs> So it went be da da be da da da, and then tried to to write in the drumline kick before that, and we couldn't do it because it was so awkward and wrong. And he was just yelling at us, and we were like, "It's wrong! It's you didn't write! It doesn't go like this!" <laughs> oh. so anyway, and it ended up with um. The entire band, like all 200 of us saying, everybody was like, it doesn't start on the downbeat. It starts. And he got real like, pissed off. Like, together? You guys said that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because he, he was arguing and yelling at the drum line, and then the brass guys chimed in. And then, you know, like, when the piccolo players are telling you the rhythm is wrong, it's, like, really wrong. You know? Anyway. <laughs> I think this actually has a lot to do with my topic today, this whole thing about confidence and competence. And this would have been a moment where <laughs> I would I would have, as a teacher, just said, OK, hey, I made a mistake, but we have to do it this way or something or, you know, I mean. Or I made a mistake it. and I'm human and I'm going to change right. it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Sorry about that. I'll fix it for the next rehearsal. Yeah. Right. Oh, today. exactly. Was... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, instead he was telling us that we were inadequate because we couldn't play what he wrote. And, yeah. Wow, great yeah. teaching moment. Yeah, that that actually that ties into a, I I had a uh, a director that I worked under at one point at uh, at, a, at a school, and his met his educational methodology was to yell at you and berate you until you did things right. And I like, that was one of those teaching moments of like, okay, here's exactly what not to do. Exactly. Yeah. yeah that should hey, be. let's do another question that has to do with your uh, composition. This is from Francisco Perez. Thanks, Franco, for the question. It, it, it is, what has had the greatest impact and influence in your compositional style? I mean, I mean, there's a there's a lot of things 
but probably the probably the biggest would actually have to be like the bands that we were talking about honestly at the beginning of the podcast um you know 90 percent of what i listen to is like modern progressive rock and progressive metal and stuff like that and so that's probably had the the biggest influence and then you throw in the composer the the more classical composers that influenced me like Christopher Rouse, uh, you know, um, Samuel Barber, Satie, um, Schwantner, all those guys. And it becomes this amalgamation of things. But yeah, mostly bands like Protest the Hero, uh, the first couple Periphery albums, uh, Dream Theater, which you and I are big fans of, uh, Casey, the earlier stuff. Um, uh, it's, that's where most of my influences come from, if you will. Yeah. Uh, in terms of compositional style, at least I would guess. Yeah, great, great. Hey, well, speaking of composers, oh, sorry, Laurel, you got something? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm always interested to know what um, what kind of the most meaningful artistic inspirations are that aren't other musicians. Yeah. Authors and that, and or... Sure, and that, and I mean, a lot, I, I kind of, whenever I see, whenever I see something that that I think is cool that especially that I'm always looking for non-musical things that I immediately think to myself, okay, is there a concept here that I can bring into a piece? Um, but it can be just about anything, uh, a work of art. Uh, I mean, probably the, I mean, probably the best, the best example would be my piece, uh, parallel, which was, uh, inspired by this video game called dear Esther, which is this really, really unique, game that many debate isn't even really a game or the, the the joke in the video game world is that it's a walking simulator because you really there's no skill to it you literally start in a place you're you're on this kind of desolate island you look up and you see that there's a radio tower and the whole game it's like maybe five hours long the whole game is literally you just walking towards that beacon but as you're walking um you'll hit these kind of picture like imaginary tripwires, if you will, that'll trigger narration. But as you walk, it won't just trigger one narration, it'll trigger one of three or four different narrations. And you do this, and you get piecemeal together this story, but then if you play it again, maybe instead of getting dialogue A, you'll get dialogue C that time. And now you get dialogue D the next time instead of B, and so on and so forth. So you get this really, really interesting atmosphere and story, and it was just so... I would, My thought was, I want to create an atmosphere like this. I want to try and turn some things on its head and just create a piece that is all about atmosphere and so that's that's what i at least tried to so avoid. so there's no magic wizard armor or hand grenades there is no enemies to shoot there is nothing i mean it's it, there's no there is literally no skill to it if you can push a button to walk forward and you can run a, use a mouse you're pretty much good to go in that game parallels looks um looks hard it i it was kind of i I tend to write things and just be like, oh, I'm sure they can do it. It's fine. And then, yeah, then I get curses. I uh, There's a piece I wrote called Down Cycle for Marimba Soloist and Percussion Trio for Scott Herring. And I remember getting videos from him that were just like, look at what you're making me do. And then he would put down his phone and proceed to play some lick that I was like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great piece, though. And I love that you use the pipes from Threads, you know, because that was something where it was like, you know, okay, we have these pipes, so we played threads, and, right. you know, so it's, it's kind of like, oh, what, what else can you use these for? So, you yeah, know, it's you, nice that that, risk... and also your marimba piece, listen to your marimba piece with the Thief. pipes. Thief. Thief, yes, yeah, both great pieces, but it's nice that you can use those same pipes. Yeah, when you, when you risk cutting your finger off to make threads pipes, you'd like to use them again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, and so, ne but, ne but now I consciously avoid using them because I don't want to become the, the I don't want to be the pipe, pipe guy. Pipe. I don't want to be the guy that's like, oh, yeah, you got to have threads pipes in order to play anything of Nosny's. Like, I, I love that color. I, that was where I first, I played the pipe part in threads at UK, and I had to make them, Ben, with my Dremel in my garage, and yes, almost lost a few fingers. Yeah. I just gave my students hacksaws and had them do it. <laughs> I just I just emailed Brian and told him to send me some. <laughs> yeah, that's what I did the first time. That's yeah, I'm, uh, I'm embarrassed to say I'm trying to find where to buy them because <laughs> I don't want to. I took them. Brian. I took those pipes that you made me to Jordan and I left them there. So you now, know, uh, now uh, Amon uh, Jordan uh, also has. Ago. 
a spice. long time ago we talked about uh on the episode when i covered the old deegan stuff deegan used to actually make a an old pipe of phone it's called a that, tuba phone yeah yeah um that would have been perfect but then brian we were going back to a relevant topic <laughs> we were talking about your uh your musical influences and the piece i mentioned purdy's maze i remember mm-hmm. something about you had was it a cousin or something like that that made mazes yeah, my cousin, my cousin Mike, when we were kids, um, he would draw these mazes on like uh, uh, <laughs> I w- he would draw these mazes with um, just a ballpoint pen and a loose leaf sheet of paper. But we're talking like the the space between the lines was like just tiny. Like you had to go like this to the page just to be able to see how close they were. And years later, I said, you know, hey, man, because. This is not an insult to my family, but him and I are the only two kind of creative entities in our family. Otherwise, we don't know where the heck we came from because everyone else is just does something not of the creative ilk, if you will. And um, so I asked him if he would draw a maze for me. He's like, "Ah, I don't really do that. I was like, well, if you draw me a maze, I'll write you a piece. He's like, all right, well, write the piece first because otherwise I'm not going to bother to do it. And so (laughs) that's kind of where it all came from. And initially, the piece was supposed to be a maze. The, The score had all four players have their own theme, but one player one's theme is shared and the idea i had was that that was the path through the maze that every measure would have some form of that theme and that so you could follow the score and that was your path through the maze and i did that for about 90 seconds until it just got way too frustrating and started to sound (laughs) awful and i went okay we're 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 done with that idea let's just write what sounds good gotcha Mm -hmm. well speaking of what sounds good ben who do you got (laughs) to talk to us about today that yeah. was a great segue. A great segue. <laughs> Amazing segue. Um, yeah, so um, Brian had gotten in touch with me, and uh, he's actually the, the only person that's ever said, what's our topic going to be for this week? Um, and so I had thought about doing Gareth Farr, because he's sort of a percussion slash composer person like Brian, but Brian suggested Christopher Rouse, because he wrote his dissertation on Christopher Rouse. Um, so that's what I'm doing. And if you're curious for more information, you can find Brian's dissertation online. Um, And it almost feels silly for me to sit here and tell you guys this stuff because Brian's the one that knows all of this, but I will. (laughs) Um, So Christopher Rouse is an American composer. He was born February 15th, 1949. So his birthday is actually coming up in 10 days. Happy early birthday, Christopher Rouse. He studied composition with Richard Hoffman at the Oberlin Conservatory, where he graduated in 1971. Then he continued on to study privately with George Crum after his graduation. After some private studies with Crum, he did graduate studies with Karel Husa at Cornell University, where he completed his studies in 1977. Following that, he served on the faculties of the University of Michigan and the Eastman School of Music. And he currently, since I think it was 1997, teaches at Juilliard. He's a multiple award-winning composer. Um, just a few of the awards he's won are the BMI Student Composer Award in 1972 and 1973, which was one of his first large accolades, as well as the Kennedy Center Freedom Award, the Pulitzer Prize, and a Grammy Award for Best Classical Composition, which I think was his trombone concerto. He served as a composer in residence at the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, Tanglewood Music Festival, and the New York Philharmonic, among others. And some of his notable students, just a few, are Michael Tork, Nico Mouli, Mark Mellitz, and Kevin Putz. Um, And he's been described, this was sort of halfway what I read online and halfway what I put together. He's a neo-romantic composer, often drawing quotes from past masters, integrating tonality and non-tonality with exquisite orchestration and extensive use of percussion. And he has, in particular, four percussion works I wanted to briefly discuss today. Three of them are in Bryant's dissertation because they're for percussion. Found all four, nice. (laughs) And then he also has a um, percussion concerto. So uh, the earliest one is Ogun Badagri, which I know Casey has recorded at JMU, and I've had my percussion ensemble perform. It's his oldest extant percussion ensemble work. It was composed while he was a student at Cornell and premiered by the Ithaca College Percussion Ensemble. Um, And I, I loved in Brian's dissertation reading about Christopher Rouse described a lot of early percussion music as quiet ping pong swish music, which he said seemed to sort of deny percussionists their their fundamental right to beat the hell out of the instruments. So he he wrote a piece in stark contrast to that. It's very loud, very aggressive, very sort of barbaric. Um, it's inspired by a Haitian voodoo ritual called a juba dance. 
Um, but it's not sort of an ethnomusicological study of it. It's not in any way authentic to the original music. And he says this is sort of the same relationship that Debussy had to Gamelon music, where Debussy heard this music, was inspired by it, but that's about as far as the, the research went of it. Um, the title of the work is the name of a voodoo deity who is associated with uh, human blood sacrifice. Um, so the work has a sort of tribal, again, barbaric quality to it. It's mostly written for unpitched percussion instruments, a lot of sort of ethnic Latin instruments, including congas, bongos, timbales, cymbals, maracas, vibrasap, wiro, lion's roar. The only really pitched percussion instrument is timpani, which Christopher Rouse says he really just treats like big tom-toms. They're not meant to have some sort of harmonic relationship. Um, it's a sort of programmatic work. The, the sections take the audience through the, the ritual, the voodoo ritual, and it ends with this uh, dramatic chanting of Rele, 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 which is the voodoo equivalent of Amen. It's sort of very violent <laughs> toward the end of the piece. Um, his next percussion ensemble work was from 1978. It was composed for the Syracuse Symphony Percussion Ensemble, and it's called Kuka Ilimoku. Ku is a Polynesian god, sort of similar to Zeus, sort of the, the king god, who takes on uh, different forms. And Kuka Ilimoku is the god of war. Um, so Rouse describes this as a savage war dance. Again, it draws uh, inspiration from this original ethnic music, but it does not try to, in some sort of accurate sense, reproduce it. Um, again, it's mostly unpitched percussion, including a lot of wood sounds. Um, so claves, log drums, wood blocks, timbales, bongos. Um, the only two pitched instruments are, again, timpani, um, which, again, he says, are not used in the sort of classical, harmonic, melodic Western sense. And an instrument called boobams, which was a specific request from the commissioning ensemble. Um, and boobams are sort of like uh, octobonds that we have today. And he says that because they're so relatively unavailable, it's okay to substitute octobonds or uh, high tom-toms or something like that. He prefers not rototoms, though. He says he doesn't like the sound of rototoms. Um, and again, it's very similar in its sort of textures to Ogun Badagri. It has the rhythmic interlocking. It's sort of tribal, barbaric sounding. Um, and then he says, after the success of these first two percussion ensemble works, he, he wanted to resist being typecast as a sort of percussion ensemble composer. So he actually took an 11-year hiatus from writing for a percussion ensemble after these first two works. Um, so at the end of that hiatus, 1989, um, he had, since 1983, been teaching uh, the first accredited rock and roll history course at the Eastman School of Music because he loved this genre since his youth. So in 1989, when Frank Epstein and the New England Conservatory Percussion Ensemble commissioned Christopher Rouse, he wrote a work called Bonham, which he says is an ode to rock drumming and drummers, particularly John Bonham of Led Zeppelin, who, of course, the piece bears his name. Um, it contains different quotes from Led Zeppelin songs. It starts with the, the drum beat from When the Levee Breaks, um, and it also has little riffs from Custard Pie and Royal Orleans. Um, then it also references Get Yourself Together by the Butterfield, Butterfield Blues Band and the Bo Diddley Handbone Rhythm. It's scored for eight percussionists, player eight, again, it's mostly unpitched instruments, and player eight um, is sort of functions as a soloist playing drum set. Um, and he says to use the fattest sticks possible to imitate the sound of John Bonham. On a personal note, I did this piece my first year teaching in Florida at Florida Atlantic University, and it was a really big honor for me to get to share the stage with my colleague Tony Lavender, who played the solo drum set part. Um, and Tony actually just passed away about a week and a half ago or something like that. So I'm planning on doing this piece again at some point in the near future as a cool. tribute to my dear friend. So sorry um, about that, Ben. Yeah, um, it was it was expected, but, you know, never. That's hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then the last work we're going to talk about today is uh, Christopher Rouse's Percussion Concerto, which he says, he calls it actually more like a percussion fantasy because it's not the traditional sort of concerto soloist form, but it is also a percussion concerto. So that's what I'm calling it. Um, and it's called Der Geretet Alberich. It's from 1997. It was written for Evelyn Glennie and co-commissioned by the London Symphony the Cleveland Orchestra, the Philadelphia Orchestra, and the Baltimore Symphony. It was premiered January 15th, 1998 by the Cleveland Orchestra, and Rouse describes it as an informal sequel to Wagner's Ring Cycle. Um, the title translates to Alberich Saved, and Alberich is this villainous dwarf in the Ring Cycle who kind of sets uh, this chaos in motion at the beginning of the, the opera, 
And then, really, his fate is left uncertain. We don't really see what happens to him. So, uh, Rouse sort of reimagines Alvarez's backstory, um, and uh, he he wants to sort of uh, see what Alvarez is up to today. <laughs> so, he begins with the coda from the end of the Ring Cycle, which was also quoted by Leonard Bernstein in West Side Story. Fun fact. Um, but then it, it, so there's this beautiful coda directly quoted from Wagner. And then the soloist enters by scraping weiros and it's supposed to sound like evil laughter. And then it, the, the work is just a riot. It kind of takes the audience on this journey of Alberich's return to create all sorts of chaos on earth. And, uh, one of the best parts of it is the soloist ends up on drum set and, uh, Alberich has returned as some sort of hellacious demonic 1970s rock and roll drummer. <laughs> Which I think is just the the perfect sequel to Wagner's Ring Cycle. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. That's awesome. So uh, yeah, that's uh, those are Christopher <laughs> Ross's percussion works. So it, it, there's actually, believe it or not, there is there is one more percussion ensemble piece. Really? Uh, there is, but it's out of print. Uh, it's called Falconus Luminous that he wrote for uh, a previous topic of yours, uh, Black Earth. Gotcha. No and, way. Uh, but he uh, he's pulled it. Uh, it's no longer in print. And this was actually one of the striking things uh, when I got to interview Rouse for the dissertation. He said, um, I asked him about it. I was like, you know, you've got this piece. And he's like, I oh, mean, I forgot I had even written that and stuff. And I said, well, you know, it's you know, so it's not it's not in print anymore. Was that like the publisher just saying, like, it doesn't really it's not really selling. So we're going to pull it or whatever. And he basically said, no, no, that was me. He said, I have no problem. I think the quote was something like, I have no problem sending Dr. Kevorkian over to kill off pieces that are no longer up to snuff. <laughs> and so oh, and he's boy. he's done. He's done this a bunch. Apparently, wow. he went over to England for some chamber music concert where they were doing a, uh, this group was doing all music of his and he got there and looked at the program and went they're doing what like there were a couple pieces on there he's like I thought I'd pulled that and mm -hmm. immediately wow. like called the publisher after he's like get this thing out of here because he just doesn't want those pieces around anymore which I thought was really shocking that's interesting I also wonder how much of that since they are published already it's not just like it's a manuscript sitting on his desk I wonder how much audience perception and performer perception plays into his perception ultimately of the work you know yeah maybe um i mean the, but, i mean the, people are still playing this stuff um maybe not so much but i wonder if it was just people didn't like it and he was like oh yeah no i don't like it i don't know and pulls it he, he seemed to sound like he just he doesn't feel that they're very good pe like they're very good pieces if he doesn't feel it's a very good piece he does he doesn't i think he's basically like, i don't want to hear you know what it. i mean what i mean that's it's not it's not completely unheard of. I mean, a lot of classical composers, I know Brahms and Sibelius both come to mind as people who just, you know, weren't satisfied with the older works and just destroyed them. Right. Yeah. So I, I just, I just found it really interesting that he's just like, yeah, if I, if I don't like it, I'm just, I'm just pulling it. It's out of there. Cause I remember asking, um, I had a conversation with Ben Walland about this and asking him about, you know, what do you think of that, about that? Would you pull older works or what, you know, uh, you know, what your your opus one? Would you would you pull it if you know people were like, oh, Ben Wallen wrote this and what? And his he said something pr really profound to me. He was just like, no, I would hope that anyone that would look at the date would realize that it was written when I was younger, and so that was my voice at that time, and and that's o and that's okay. That was what I had to say at that moment. So I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong answer. Sure. Yeah, say. that's interesting. I haven't really thought about that much before since I'm not a composer. <laughs> That's actually, I, I have the same answer to that as well. It's like, well, I liked it back then. So, you know, the language I'm operating at now probably isn't as fitting to someone in the same mindset as I was back then. And that older piece might be. So, hey, if they like it, fine. You know? Well, I mean, yeah. look at, look at, you know, any composer, you know, uh, List is a great example that comes to mind for me. All of List's early works were these, you know, just ridiculous virtuosic piano pieces and then he got to the point where he said, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to actually study composition and make, you know, real grand scale symphonic sorts of works of music. Um, and Liszt could have just burned his entire early catalog and said, you know, only perform my late orchestral works. But we still have pianists playing these early virtuosic Liszt pieces. It's just different, yeah. you know, phases of a composer's life. Yeah, absolutely. So, Brian, and maybe forgive me if you said this, but where does that unknown percussion ensemble fit chronologically it's, into the order it's of the before three? Before everything. 
is gotcha, before yeah. everything. Okay. Well, because yeah, on, on Brian's dissertation, he actually said it's the uh, he said Ogun Badagri is the oldest extant percussion ensemble work, nice. which made me think there was probably something to that. Yeah, uh, and I mean he was at Oberlin with all the guys in Black Earth, so that's that's that was the connection there, and why yeah. he was, uh, all of the pieces, you know, he's got some sort of connection to those to those people or or something like that um yeah and it, it was fascinating and i was able to get a, a score um because you know i'm writing it at kentucky and jim kind of prides himself on that library he wants to have just the he wants to have the um the most extensive library of percussion ensembles well, don't tell on- christopher rouse because he'll burn it down <laughs> i know i know right and so he does have a copy there and so i was able to get a score and it's it's rather it's a little bit, um, it's a little more esoteric to a point. You need to have some sort of like toy apple thing that when you shook it, it, it made like some sort of laughing sound or something like that. Or may, it, he had like a bunch of kind of wacky sounds in there a little bit and stuff. It's definitely not the Rouse that we know of with Ogun and Kuka. Yeah. Yeah. So. Hey, I would like to know everyone's favorite of the three. Mine's Kuka. 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 It's hard for me to say because I'm not as familiar with Kuka because I've never I've never done it. I've only heard it performed once. Yeah, I'm but I don't. I think it. audience is like Bonham the best. I like mm. Bonham. <laughs> I, Laurel, Caleb, Ogun, Ogun. Oh, you said that. Yeah, we talked about this. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, I don't know Kuka as well, but I played Ogun and enjoyed it. So yeah. <laughs> Have um, you guys heard I, of the concerto? I I've heard it once. Uh, it didn't it didn't strike me in. Um, in such a way to to want to listen to it more. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, Chad, um, have you guys I saw heard? Ted Adcats play it in Florida, mm-hmm. and there's there's a recording of him playing it with CSU Long Beach on YouTube, he and there's also a very good recording of um, Colin Curry with uh, Marion yeah. Alsop conducting on YouTube. Have you guys heard Gorgon? No, I saw that name when I was doing my research. No. That piece is wild. It uses Mahler box. It's oh really yeah. Cool. Um, is it? It's an orchestra piece. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, well, and actually, uh, you know, out of the concerto, and I, I, I say I call it mine, but it's I don't think it's 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 pronounced that way. But he has a snare drum solo that he wrote for Evelyn Glennie that he wanted that she wanted a an encore piece, and so he wrote this little like you know two minute you know kind of virtuosic snare drum piece. So there there there's a little more Rouse out there, but he um. You know, he consciously avoided percussion because he didn't want to be labeled as a percussion composer. Because oh. Ogun and Kuka were getting played a ton when they were first written. Yeah. Well, that's probably basically all we had at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I mean, and and they're really high quality pieces because when mm-hmm. that rep was first in development, there were some pieces that were not so great. So everyone just kind of latched onto that. Yeah. You know, you said he didn't want to be labeled as a percussion composer. Do you think that's a or I guess let's ask Brian. Do you think there's a stigma being labeled a percussion composer? No, I don't think so at all. I think that he. I mean, I'm I'm a percussion composer. I mean, I have a, you know, I've written for other instruments when I was, you know, in graduate school for my comp masters. But I, I've, I haven't consciously avoided it. But I, I guess I should say I consciously tried to write for just percussion because I knew that I had that skill set and I wanted to push myself forward in the percussion world. Mm-hmm. But I think that he was the other side of that. He had some notoriety because of his percussion works, but he wanted to be known as a composer that was writing everything and anything. And so I think because of that, he he went, okay, it's I've I've said what I need to say there. It's time for me to start focusing on these other things. Otherwise, everyone's just going to be calling him for percussion ensemble pieces. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, you guys, I have a little item to share with you all this week and i bumped into this on npr and i thought it was pretty interesting so i thought i would uh do a little digging and come up with something for you on the value and importance of confidence so i think we've all heard over and over that it's very very important to have confidence and you can find this information on Uh, if you dig hard enough on the npr.org website but you can also find it on the harvard business review which is definitely the fanciest sounding website i've ever visited (laughs) 
<laughs> and this comes from the research of someone named Tomas Camaro Pre-Music, and he's a professor at University College of London. And he says that confidence has two faces, an internal and external. The external face looks very much like extroversion. Extroverts are usually more charismatic than introverts, at least in most Western societies. However, one can be internally confident without projecting that on others. And when people see us as overly confident, you will see us as arrogant and even obnoxious rather than charming and extroverted. Narcissists are, of course, a very good example of this. So, of course, he's kind of talking about people in a leadership role and also in like the office workplace. But I think it applies a lot to musicians because we always hear ourselves tell each other and students, oh, just be confident. You have to have confidence. You're doing the interview. Be confident. We hear this like all the time. So anyway, and of course, we as teachers have leadership roles, section leaders, etc. So I think it's pretty dang applicable to music. So let me, let me continue for a bit. And please, it's kind of long, so feel free to interrupt any moment. Because confident people tend to be more charismatic, extroverted, and socially skilled, which are all highly desirable features in most cultures, we tend to equate confidence with competence. In reality, however, there is a very big, big difference between confidence and competence. Competent people are generally confident, but confident people are generally not competent. So let me try that one more time because that's a very mm. tricky sentence to both read and listen to. Competent people are generally confident, but confident people are generally not competent. Tomas's research has found that people who lead from the standpoint of humility yield much better results than those that lead from that of confidence. The right amount of confidence is good, but the right amount is actually quite lower than what people tend to think. Confidence is, excuse me, confidence is useful when it is an accurate measurement of competence, when it is fully aligned with one's actual ability. In other words, confidence that helps you understand how good or bad you are at something. Being self-aware and able to truly judge your abilities is the best scenario. The common belief is that more confidence is better regardless. This is unfortunate because not only can it be completely unrelated to competence, but it also distorts our perception of all the toxic side effects of overconfidence, such as recklessness, rash decisions, bad decisions, uh, even dangerous decisions, laziness. Most car wrecks are caused by drivers who are overconfident. Most bad financial decisions, like the big market crash, is by overconfident investors and uh, etc. These toxic effects affect growth and ability. We spend a lot of time concerning ourselves with our kids' self-esteem. Maybe we can counter these negative effects by promoting the benefits of humility. He goes on to say that this is particularly a problem with millennials, so sorry everybody. Uh, but Brian, you're not a millennial, right? I actually just had this debate with some friends. I guess I'm on the cusp of it so maybe i could be maybe not so but i also yeah. act like i'm like five years old so i guess <laughs> <laughs> you're a generation out. y <clears throat> yeah exactly yeah you're born in 2001 um yep. well i i'm i'm right on the cusp too i'm definitely technically a millennial but i read the attributes of both millennials and generation xers and i f i certainly feel i match a generation xer much more but that's also i think my you know immediate older brother and sisters are our generation Xers and whatever. But mm -hmm. um, he does say that this whole thing with millennials, we have a new type of idol, such as the Paris Hiltons, the Kim Kardashians. And to put it the way South Park put it, these are people who are famous for just being famous. Mm -hmm. They don't have, sorry, they don't have competence in any type of traditional sense. Whereas Led Zeppelin had competence in some type of skill or talent. Christopher Rouse is famous for his talent. He's not famous just because he's famous. So this would be a case of here are these confident people that are putting themselves out there and being seen, but there's no competent talent to back it up. <laughs> the way I, I just I have a question about that, Casey, and like yeah. I'm not I, I just can't think of an example, but are we sure that's a new phenomenon? Like has there been someone before it like before now, so to speak, that has been just famous for the sake of being famous? I can't I'm, think of anyone. I was just asking. I, I'm glad you asked. According to his research, and 
everything I've read so far has been straight from his research or at least paraphrasing his words or directly quoting his words. But that's a really good question. And in one of his interviews, they asked him that. And he said, yes, we know that because he's looked back at, I think he said, three generations of the same questionnaires. So people will do these types of studies yeah. where they'll they'll give the the you know, the baby boomer generation, a questionnaire, and then they give that same questionnaire to the generation Xers, the same questionnaire to millennials. And they don't have really any foresight to what exactly this information will be used for, but then studies like this will draw from it. So uh, according to him, yeah, he knows it's particular to millennials. Yeah. And I, I feel like it's, you know, the internet is a big like uh, megaphone that probably amplifies that sort of celebrity. For sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, I would ar I would argue though that you know in previous generations, maybe not that far from now, even in the 1800s, that you know families in the monarchy, you know people who were just born into the royal bloodline, are probably not especially talented at anything, but they're famous because they just have the right grandpa, you know. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I I, and they get I shouldn't speak to anything and... about that because he didn't it didn't go into his research. But yeah, I mean you 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 certainly sound right. Yeah, I wouldn't well, think it's a new concept. He's maybe just the voice of it right now. Yeah, research. but 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 think of think of how how like definite it is today. You know, oh, I mean yeah. those people. I mean it, they're like huge. They're like mega mega superstars. I mean you could maybe make the case that hey the monarchs are famous for the same reason the president of the United States is famous, whether that person's talented or not, you know who they are because they have a specific station or a real specific role. So uh, e even then, I, I bet you could make a case for this is unusual. Well, and I find it interesting that there's a there's another side to the these people that are famous for things that they're not actually good at, I would say. Um, one of my one mm. of my things that I have to teach here at Troy is online music appreciation. And the whole final week we talk about, we have these discussion questions about um, issues concerning popular music today. And one mm. of them I talk about is, um, uh, how do I call it, um, performance enhanced music. So the you know you think about uh, the the best video I can think of that comes to mind is there was a Katy Perry video from a few years ago where she was um she was on a um some sort of French award show and she comes out and she's singing and dancing there's all the backup dancers and the 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 MC comes out and stops everything because obviously there was something weird happening with the with the the backing tape and stuff like that and he's like you know we we want you to sound your best and blah so can, so can we do it again from the top and it was something with her vocal track so they took her vocal track out mm. and she actually had to sing and it was disturbing I've right seen actually that. her yeah. real voice it was yeah I that. off and so you you have to wonder like okay she's famous for being this quote great singer and entertainer and stuff but the reality is and maybe she had an off night but the mm. reality is most likely she's actually got no very little talent in singing so it's interesting to see these people that have become famous for something that they're really actually that they're supposedly good at, but they're actually not good at. Well, and I think that is his whole point with mentioning that. And it is a pretty quick just aside. And he's tr he's not trying to make a huge point about millennials or this specifically, but he is saying that this notion of confidence makes us think that someone is competent is even more evident today because of things like that. You go out there, you're confident, people s tell you it's good even though it's not, you're more likely to believe it. And and I mean, it correlates with what I've heard. I mean, how many times have you heard, oh yeah, just be confident. It's all about confidence and confidence. And uh, he, he even says that he starts one of his talks or lectures by saying, okay, how many of you in the room if you could have one magic pill that would increase an attribute of yours they almost always pick the confidence pill because uh, people just think it is so important and they've done surveys on the same thing and, and, and people say that uh, well let's see I've got some more here so he preaches that humility is actually quite valuable and that we should be teaching humility more than confidence so 
Continuing on, he says, internal humility operates as a reality check, and it helps you to be aware of your weaknesses. It helps you be humble, which means you understand that you're not as great as you would like to be. Humility can highlight a discrepancy between the person you want to be and the person you think you are. This actually drives self-improvement because you will try to close the gap between your ideal self and your perceived self. That makes so much sense to me. I think that's just freaking brilliant. Uh, if you're totally confident in your abilities, you've reached the ceiling and you're done and you don't see where your improvement is. External humility is not just very important, but very underrated, especially in the U.S. All of the evidence from psychological research suggests that humility makes you more likable, and even in the U.S., so that when people perceive you are more competent than you think you are, they will like you more. And, and conversely, external confidence when they see you are less competent than they think you are, they will like you less. And I think we've all experienced this. Someone says, oh, yeah, man, I'm just going to nail it. I'm going to rock it. You're, and then when they rock it, you're not impressed. <laughs> you know, you're like, well, that's OK. Yeah, that's what you said you would do. And certainly when it goes the other way around, which it often does, you you don't take them seriously anymore. You think, oh, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. And because they bragged about how amazing it was going to be and then it was less than so, not only don't you trust them anymore, but you also think they're incompetent. And that is a demonstration of incompetence. Like, well, you're wrong. And if you thought that was amazing and it turned out not to be, then you don't know what amazing is. So a question is how do we know if what we're feeling is actual genuine humility or if we're just being a bit insecure and actually underrating our own abilities he says well it doesn't really matter whether it's one or the other either way your confidence is highlighting self-perceived deficits in your competence which makes the case for trying to imp improve so the saying, fake it till you make it, should you fake confidence? He says, you should only fake confidence when you're unable to fake competence. So if you can't pretend that you're good at something, then pretend that you are confident. But when you are really competent, so when you really have the skills or talent in a domain, you are much better off with modesty than confidence. It will even enhance others' perception of your talent. He also adds, but I think there's one fundamental point that's hardly ever discussed, which is that the short-term personal benefits of faking confidence come at a very high price, which are the collective deficits in competence. Imagine a world where doctors, teachers, engineers, and pilots were selected on the basis of their confidence as opposed to their actual ability. We've already seen this because it's exactly what happens in politics. And you don't have to point to any recent politic, political issues to see this. It's very evident and obvious all over the place. Mm. And there's all sorts of popular essays and blogs out there written about how to sell brands and how to become more com a more confident speaker when really they are sending the wrong message, which is this is how you should fool other people into thinking you're actually good at something. So that's the end of Tomas's research. And I took this little question to Facebook just to see if this feeling was accurate out there with our friends and the people who, uh, you know, the couple of people who pay attention to me on Facebook. And we got some really good responses. And I think all of them were describing confidence as a substitute for confidence. Or excuse me, confidence for a substitute of competence. So just to quote some of our people here, why not just start with Caleb? He's right here. He describes the importance of confidence in yourself as a leader, and it's pivotal to creating a work environment. And my favorite thing that you say, Caleb, is the, the young people smelling fear Attri yeah, right. attribute. You, yeah, of course you have to be in charge and you have to show leadership. But I would argue that that's actually in that specific situation, that is competence, not necessarily confidence. That is knowing how to handle this situation. Um, so again, I think it's what Caleb said is 100% correct, but it does demonstrate that our general belief in what confidence is, is competence. Let's see. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, Jeremy Smith says, this is extremely important, especially to be able to take critique as data to be used in one's own advantage rather than personal value judgments. 
Let's see, Alan Lang, who is an old student of Laurel and I's at Concord University, he says, for me, self-confidence is extremely important. From a personal perspective, it is one of the biggest things to make your goals and actions come true. And he goes on to say, describing being a lifeguard, that you have to be confident in your abilities. If someone needs your help in the water, you need to know that you can go in there and save them. So I think that's a great example because if one was overconfident in this and they didn't have an accurate perception of their ability, it would be really bad. So I am not a lifeguard. I think I could save a, you know, a, a small child. But if three grown adult men were drowning in a pool, I would not be able to save them. You need to know that about yourself. So again, I think Alan is describing competence but using the word confidence. Um, so uh, one other person, sorry, I know this is going on quite a bit. Where is this little comment regarding something called the Dunning-Kruger effect? This is by... It's one up. Oh, one up. Did you find it? Oh, thanks. William. Yeah. William Borer says, it's important to be confident while maintaining an open attitude because you honestly don't know where you are on that chart that illustrates the Dunning-Kruger effect. So this is an older study that talks about this exact same thing and it shows that people who think they are really competent actually score lower on tests that they think they did really well on so for example we hand out a bunch of tests and we ask people how did you do on the test the ones who ranked themselves really high actually did really poor the ones who did really well either had a an accurate assessment of how well they did or they ranked themselves lower so, of course, what's going on there is the whole student for life concept. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. If you're really competent at material, you realize how much more is out there and how deep and depthful the material is. And this is from something called, let's see, from New Planet School, which is a YouTube channel. And this is called the Dunning-Kruger Effect. And they give us some quotes and let us know that some of our most brilliant minds out in history have known this and are well aware of this concept. So you can kind of follow them chronologically, but I'll just give you a few that, that they shared. Real knowledge is to know the extent of one's ignorance. That is by Confucius. I know nothing except for the fact of my ignorance. That's from Plato. The fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. Laurel, who said that? Shakespeare. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, so even Shakespeare. Uh, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge, Charles Darwin. And so on through history, Mark Twain, uh, George Bernard Shaw. One of my favorite ones is from Bertrand Russell because he's just one of my favorite um, idea creators out there. One of the painful things about our time is that those who feel certainty are stupid and those with any imagination are filled with doubt and indecision. So anyway, a very old idea that tends to be very shared by competent people. And I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a couple things I wanted to share. Just yeah. two quick little anecdotes. Um, my dad was a uh, computer consultant, um, sort of, I guess, starting in the late 70s, early 80s, something like that. Um, and he always remarked that the second you told someone you were a consultant, they immediately put way too much trust in you for no reason at all. <laughs> uh, they, they just bought into the idea of you're some sort of you know expert in this field just because you said I'm a consultant. Um, so there's a little I think example of where you know confidence can uh, overshadow competence, which I mean hopefully he was competent as well. But um, and then the other thing that's brought up, especially when you're talking about humility. Um, one of my favorite musicians is, and probably everyone here is, uh, Michael Tilson Thomas, the conductor of the San Francisco symphony and new world symphony orchestra. Um, and one of the interesting things I found about Michael Tilson Thomas is that not only is he revered as a musician, but he's actually noticed outside of the musical field for being a leader. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I thought that I, I remember reading some sort of, um, accolade that he had got for his leadership and maybe this was it maybe you're not but it looks like in 2008 u.s news and world report ranked michael tilson thomas as one of america's best leaders i think it was the top 50 um and there's a uh, a quote in the article from about this that says it's from yo-yo ma 
And he says, what's unique about what Michael is doing is it's done with ego checked at the door. The priorities are absolutely in the right order. It's about the music. Um, That's and great. I, yeah, if you've, if you've ever, I mean, I wouldn't say I've met Michael Tilson Thomas, but I've seen him conduct on a number of occasions. And really, I mean, it, it's, it's a very, it, you know, he ab absolutely has that Bernstein level mastery of the music, but it's done without any sort of ego, ego or look at me quality. Um, so yeah, that's right. definitely a great example, I think, of leadership without ego. Yeah, Caleb, what do you got? Yeah, I think it's <clears throat> sorry. I think it's weird that uh, when we talk about confidence and competence, it seems like the people talking are always really competent and confident. Um, yeah, so if you take, say, um, John Gorey's got a good book called Performing in the Zone that deals with some of this stuff, and he has a formula. It's basically P equals P minus I. It's a big P and a little P. So your performance, if we're talking about uh, musical competence, like in a performance situation, your performance is going to be equal to your preparation. So say you did everything right, minus that interference uh, variables from stage, sound feedback, lights, anxiety, crowds, anything like that. That's going to detract from your performance or from your preparation that will make your performance. So just thinking off the top of my head, there's someone at this school without naming names that is a very good player and she's very competent. But something... It's me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Law. <laughs> It's very no, competent. No, no, it's not. Uh, it's very competent, but um, there's some issue with confidence there. Mm -hmm. So, competent musician, but something. I think we need to look at this on an, very much an individual basis, not so much a rounded out. Mm. Um, so yeah, for me, I can say I can share one of my stories. I had a very bad performing experience. Probably is probably like ten years ago at this point. Um, I'm sure jokes are coming. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was really bad. And I feel like it took me a good, like I had the preparation the piece was down. It was fine. It was great. But the performance aspect was so detrimental. I think I feel like it took a good two to three years to get like back into like a performance aspect. Like my confidence was just shot, even though mm -hmm. my competence was uh, fine. Yeah. But that is, I, I think, according to, to what this is saying, that would be an example because the performance did actually go bad, right? Right. So yeah. that that should cause some self-doubt. And that means you're not a narcissist. A narcissist can't see themselves as doing anything bad. So that means your, your barometer for reading your confidence to comp competence um, uh, accurately is is good so according to this research you are okay you know so th that's what should happen i'm gonna be okay yeah well <laughs> you're I mean, fine <laughs> you're reading it the right way what would be bad is if you didn't learn from that at all and you just remained thinking oh yeah that was amazing and i'm so good and you wouldn't grow at all a, hu a standpoint of humility is exactly that oh man that went so bad i have a lot to work on i have a lot to change about my playing and it's unfortunate that it took two years or something, but but that is what the what his information is saying. And it's nice you mentioned a, a, a girl missing confidence because that's a big part of these studies too. And it's also a big part of a lot of the self-help books out there that Tomas thinks are kind of bad and send the wrong message. So much of it is like how to – for women, how to be more confident, how to be confident in the workplace when really the research suggests men need to be more like women according to him, which is show more humility. Don't be so forward with your confidence and especially don't be overly confident. And and the, and I think it is pretty pretty round in general because he says um, in, in the, the Dunning-Kruger tests – people who score in the 12th percentile of bad testing, so incredibly low, rate themselves as scoring as high as the 60th percentile. So if you have that kind of, if you have that kind of standpoint and posture in a managerial sense, you are going to make all sorts of horrible, bad decisions, which according to Tomas is why 60% of the job I, oh, no, it's higher than that. It's, it's something like 65 or 69% of the job field 
excuse me, 60, 69% or so of the people employed are seeking new jobs. And the reason they list why is because they can't stand their bosses and their bosses are incompetent and their bosses make horrible decisions and are bad managers. So I, hmm. I think it's, I mean, of course you're right. We have to look at it case by case and every person has to have an accurate metric of how their performance adds up to their assessment of their performance. He, he, he does also say in the stunning Kruger effect, there's something called a double curse, which is people who are too incompetent to know they are incompetent. So you're, you're doing bad on the test, but you still think you did good. Of course, you're not going to see what you need to improve on. So not only do you do bad, but you can't see you're doing bad. And it's, it's a, uh, double-edged uh, negative for you. And there's also something called the imposter syndrome, which is in the Dunning and Kruger effect, the people are so competent that they assume they are incompetent, but they, so that they're so good at what they do and they know this stuff so well that they're aware of how much they don't know, thus they rate themselves just a little lower, but the gap is never nearly as big as the incompetent people. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I've talked a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, I um, a every time you say Dunning Kruger, I think of that actress Diane Kruger, and <laughs> so that's yeah. Anyway, um, but I it's so unfortunate, you know, that our society over time has continuously, I think, known about this issue, and yet we continuously reward overconfidence every time, and um, that's really. Of his big points. Yeah, like we yeah. just continue to do it, and it doesn't matter. Uh, even though we we're so aware of this, and, and Casey and I have worked with, you know, people who are on the humble scale that, you know, you see them play, and you're just like, oh my god, it's life changing. And we've worked with people that, um, in the past who who were so overconfident that over a few months you realize like, wait a minute, you don't know what you're doing. And this is really detrimental to the students and it's affecting yeah. people in a super negative way. And, but this, this topic reminds me a lot of um, the book quiet that I was reading, which is all about introverts and how, which I relate to competence and, and confidence very much in the fact that, you could know that you know what you're doing and perhaps based on your level of confidence, you may or may not put yourself out there and you might just observe what's going on. And and it seems to me that confidence in how we're discussing it here really is talking about a person's ability to bullshit, it seems <laughs> to me. Mm-hmm. And that there is a scale uh, or like a direct relationship between the level at which you can bullshit and the level at which you are aware of yourself. And right. the more you can do one, you have no ability to see um, well, how you're actually ex- performing. Ex- and exactly. You're actually and, and that's what his studies show. The people who demonstrate more confidence are more incompetent. Yeah. So, yeah. And, I, and I think back to what Caleb was saying and what you're saying with working with performers I, it always annoys me when people say like, oh, just be confident. It's like, no, it's a much, like Caleb said, a bad performance can be really detrimental to your confidence, which is why when you have a student with the shakes and just petrifying stage fright, there's no magic pill you can give them. It's a slow growing process where they gradually have to get their their competence up to a place that they can feel good about it and they can feel successful on stage once or twice and then their confidence starts to grow. Yeah. yeah, it's like a I don't it's like a journey of, you know, accepting that what you have to offer is valid. So just yeah. say it. And you know, I'm I mean everybody knows I read a lot about the brain and I guess self-help books, I suppose, but they're the ones that I love are always accepting one's self and going from there damn it ben that was that was a a good one ben (laughs) for anyone wondering what we're all laughing about there's much inappropriate dialogue going on in the the uh text feed on the side here (laughs) yeah um but yeah i think anything from a place of trying to learn about yourself and presenting your authentic self is is always the right way to go and 
just to wrap this back around to percussion directly, I was reading a book, um, I think by Brian Greene. I don't know if that's right, but it's the book where uh, the author takes every instrument family and talks about the various personality traits and how you're probably is going it Don to Don Green? Be in, huh? Not audition success, is it? Don no, Green. it's Don something else. Oh. Um, but anyway, he said that percussionists are clearly the most confident of musicians. And <laughs> I was like, I'm, I, I don't know about that. Um, you know, but his, uh, his reasoning was because we're back there and we're the only person playing our part and blah, blah, blah. If it's missed, it's us who's missed. And we tend to make noises that are always loud regardless. Um, you know, so we don't hide. So he said percussionists tend to be the most confident. Um, Interesting. You know, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I would say to students, say on job interviews or something, you think, oh, well, the person with the most confidence is going to get the job. Uh, no, I think the person that demonstrates the most competence is going to get the job. And it you're, you're dealing with a committee that is really knowledgeable in the field and thus is at that high area of the Dunning-Kruger graph. This is the content they know about. They're going to be much harder to fool than someone who is incompetent in this material. So if they ever ask a question that you don't have a good answer to, try to demonstrate some type of knowledge or interest in generating that knowledge don't just say like oh yeah i can totally do that yep i absolutely can yep can do yes sir like that they don't i don't think that's a good idea well or actually this ties into this was a, some advice that campbell gave me going into my my dissertation defense was he was talking about if they ask you a question that you don't really know the answer to instead of trying to BS or whatever, your job is basically to have enough knowledge to be able to work your way around that question to something that you do know a lot, have confidence in and know a lot about, and then talk more about that. Mm -hmm. sure. and so you can see that connection between the two. Well, well, and a similar way to do that would be to, okay, I, w when they say, hey, to teach this job, if we asked you, could, would you be able to teach a, um, uh, I, I don't know, uh, American Music history course. Class. We sometimes yeah. have to borrow mm -hmm. from departments. Could you do that? The answer is no, I'm not comfortable doing that. But you show your humility, and by doing that, you show that you're not afraid to admit being wrong, and you're not afraid to admit when you need help, and you can work around, to, like, like you said, you can work around that question to demonstrate something else that is competent, such as, hey, I would be a good colleague hey, I'm not afraid to admit when I'm wrong. And that is uh, a competent value in that type of job. Mm -hmm. so. And I, it's funny, I, I've always thought that, that we, especially going, it's, it's interesting as musicians that we have to walk into like things like auditions and actually we have to have enough confidence and belief in ourselves, though, that we're not, like you said, having the shakes or whatever, but again, but, Kale, you brought up a good point that it comes down to your your amount of preparation. And you, a lot of times I think you see the people that are that nervous are the people that just haven't bothered to put in the time. I mean, there's a, there's exceptions to the rule, but many times it's just they haven't bothered to put in the time. And that's why they're shaking and freaking out before something. Right. Yeah. And, and that's not a problem of confidence. It's a problem of competence. If they were competent, they'd feel fine. Um, right. it, it's a matter of, OK. I would practice not the material, but I would just practice not being shaky. But then when you got to play, you can't play, <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I feel like you can't have the legitimate one without competence. I mean, it just, it would all come down to competence in the end, you know? You gain confidence by act by having actual competence. Well, and yeah. I, think it ta I think it takes confidence to even walk in the room for an audition to start with. Sure. But when you freak out in it i mean yeah there are exceptions where just things go off the rails and there's just there's nothing you can do about it it snowballs but nine times out of ten when anything like that happens it's goes back to the competence part there's you just there's somewhere along the way in the preparation process you just weren't ready for what it is that you're trying to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, sorry go ahead. i was gonna say i just i just I just had a, a situation where something went wrong. Uh, uh, my wife and I have a 
flute percussion duo, and we p- were premiering a piece by Adam Silverman last week and for vibraphone and flute, and in the middle of the piece, the pedal broke. Just flat out broke, no problem. And of course, it was in the one place where I actually had to do, be doing sustain, and my immediate thought was to rely on my competence, and so I just started rolling on the vibraphone. Because I at least had enough knowledge to go, okay, here's how I can fix this problem for now and not make this whole section basically sound like what the heck is happening. Because normally it's all without pedal. So now we get to this one section that's definitely supposed to be sustaining. There's obviously something wrong here, but at least we could try and salvage what we could out of out of that performance. Awesome. Do you have something, Caleb? Uh, literally, it was the same thing, but what you do on your end of you're talking about you never stop and like we were doing the Rosaro and somebody would flub on the part and you just keep going yeah 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 competence of recovery yeah Yeah. sure. well Mm -hmm. and yeah i guess that's a a little teacher tactic people make a mistake and they sometimes want to like stop the students wants to stop and i i try to say no we don't stop because you don't get to emulate that situation (laughs) you know you can't you can't uh you can't practice mistakes real mistakes are real mistakes you know you need to keep doing it and by practicing through it you are practicing it so yeah um i would love to get some questions back around to brian just to get uh make sure he's the one who kind of closes closes our episode out we don't have to do that. Not my super long <laughs> don't have to do that. how about uh man tell us about these wind chimes brian <laughs> Yay. Um, Brandon Arfe asked about these wind chimes, and I have no idea what the deal is with that. Do you sell wind it's chimes? So beautiful. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I actually kind of have a little side company that makes glass wind chimes and uh, key chimes, and I make tuned metal pipes. I've made some for Tracy. I've made some glass chimes for Megan. Um, total random side project when i was at kentucky jim knew i had tools and i was kind of handy and so we played uh david skidmore's piece whispers that needs glass wind chimes and i happened to just live near uh uh the strip mall that every time i drove by it it had a giant sign that said stained glass so i just said he's like we need glass wind chimes i said well actually i live near a stained glass place let me go and talk to her talk to the owner and see if i can get some scrap or whatever and so i made a set um that jim has in his office at kentucky and they're awful like they sound actually really good but Hmm. they they got like hot glue draping all over they just they look god awful but it just started me thinking like okay wait if i if i just did this and this and this and i just tweaked that so i made a second set and they actually looked pretty good and sounded pretty good and then i just kind of realized that hey no one else really does this most glass wind chimes are made for aesthetics and not really for sound and I went, well, I wonder if I could start doing this. And so I just started making them and the word got out. Um, and so, yeah, they've been, I mean, I I just sent three sets to a company in a big rental company in New York City. Um, Great. Uh, Eastman has a set. Juilliard. Do you have like a, a website for this? Uh, it's just on my website, com. There's a little link. It's called Silvana Chimes. I saw that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just started doing it, and then um, I got out of it for a little while when we moved down here to Alabama, just because I didn't have a real workshop set up, and I'm I'm doing it again now. And uh, yeah, it's just, you know it's it's some I just I enjoy doing it. Like I've just always liked tinkering and creating and stuff like that, and I I guess I'm okay at it because people seem to want them. So, um, but it's all it all just came out of necessity of hey, we need those, and same thing with the threads pipes. You know, Jim said, hey, we need these. And we have we, we happen to have like a bunch of electrical conduit sitting in the back of something. He grabbed. Uh, he said, all right, Nas, go make some threads pipes. OK, made them. They were not the greatest. But then I started thinking, well, how can I do this better? And so, yeah, now Tracy has a has a few sets of pipes and um, Megan's ha- had a set. And so I'll, I'll make actually the most recent thing I had to make was for this uh, this john sothis recording stuff we do in the summer i had to make four quarter tuned pipes mm. or one particular movement of a piece so i've just kind of developed it to a point where now i can make just kind of about any tuned pipe you need i guess wow dude well i'll be calling you because <laughs> bring it on that's fine yeah that sounds really cool hey you guys thanks so much this was a, a pretty full house megan arns ben charles laurel black caleb pickering tracy wiggins and Brian Nozny, man, thanks so much for sharing and joining us. This is really yeah. cool. To see you thanks again. Thanks for having me. This was awesome. I appreciate it. 
Yeah, sure. Okay, Keep everybody, we'll living. catch you at episode 81. <laughs> <laughs> what I said, i'm gonna try living. and keep living as best i can <laughs> i missed the gag but thanks everybody see you later <laughs> bye bye